Alrighty gang, howdy again. This is uh, first video of two videos for this week's readings. This is week, what are we in here? Uh, week seven. It's the penultimate week before our uh, midterm, right? So I'm going to make this video on um, Rorty and then one more video on Burke. Uh, that'll be Thursday morning, and that'll be it for videos, I think. Yeah, that'll be it for videos for um, our first, well, half of the class, and then we have our midterm. So I think I'll put together one more video um, as a kind of review, overview, kind of pre-exam uh, attempt to kind of calm some nerves maybe and package things together a little bit for you. Um, but I need to move swiftly here today because we have ourselves uh, what is possibly our most substantial reading that we will encounter this entire semester. Uh, quite likely, actually. So the McLuhan piece that we did recently was pretty meaty and pretty substantial, but this one's even like lengthier. This is the first chapter of uh, Richard Rorty's book. I think it's called Irony and Solidarity. Um, so this is a book chapter, and um, so it's a little, you know, lengthier, a little baggier than than a, a sort of a journal article. Um, so my apologies, but this is like a super important essay on all the stuff we've been talking about, frankly. So if you read through it on your own already uh, or attempted to, hopefully you got the sense that we are still very much in the realm of the serious man and the rhetoric man. Um, it's all over this reading in key places. And if you got that much, chances are you probably got the rest of it okay. If not, then hopefully this video will help kind of illuminate that stuff and identify some key, key concepts and statements along the way. So some of the big concepts and terms in this essay involve this business of contingency, this business of language games, this business of, um, uh, what else we got here? The business of language itself and how we want to think about language as a kind of more tool-based kind of pragmatic orientation instead of some kind of invisible medium that reflects truth, right? So that's sort of the key man, the key rhetoric, serious man kind of distinction there. We'll get into that. Um, and then at the end, this business of passing theory is also pretty important, right? And so just a couple of key terms, but he spent some time really unpacking this stuff. And there's also, a, um, you know, this is a book of philosophy, of kind of pragmatic oriented philosophy. Um, and he's doing a fair amount of like positioning himself in relation to the field and the history, right? And so there's some chunks in here that we can kind of breeze over. So once again, this is your guide. This is your map for the territory that is the reading. Um, there's a certain level of granularity that we don't need to go into because it gets into all the kind of historical, this is what philosophy used to be, this is what it is today, this is what it should be. Just want to kind of hit the key ideas here and be thinking about them in relation to our other conversations. So, um, the contingency of language, first of all, contingency is this idea of indeterminacy, right? So, something that can happen can, will only happen if certain other variables are in play, right? And so, therefore, anything that we can say to happen must sort of rely on certain related conditions or circumstances, right? Um, will my wife show up at home when she says she will after a long day of work? Well, that's contingent on a million things, right? Like what else is going on around her and so on. So this idea of like something happening being dependent on other things being present. Therefore, this idea that, you know, for talk about language as contingent, talk about knowledge as contingent, basically means that it's always changing and it's always something that's on the move and it's hard to pin down and what things mean rely on circumstances and context. And so the, the, the idea that uh, language is contingent, that knowledge is contingent, that even consciousness, that, that's sort of the rest of his book. He talks about language, he talks about the self, he talks about consciousness, and all of these things are kind of up for grabs and indeterminate. They really depend on situated, circumstantial kind of phenomenon to realize themselves. That's kind of the core idea here. So right off the bat, he starts off by making this distinction that we should be familiar with by now. So he's talking about philosophy 
sort of in its dominant tradition. He was writing in the latter half of the 20th century, around the 1980s. All right, and he so he's kind of a postmodern philosopher, but in a very specific way because he's still indebted to the American pragmatist tradition, thinking about John Dewey, William James, Richard Rorty is a pretty well-known American pragmatist. He just happened to be a kind of post-structuralist, postmodern philosopher as well. So um, he's going against this serious man tradition, right? And the serious man tradition, and I think this should be familiar. This goes right back to the beginning of this class. The serious man thinks of the self as contained, self-contained, as having a kind of intrinsic quality to it. Same with language. Language is sort of contained and um, static, permanent, right? And it has its own kind of intrinsic nature. The real, the real, real world, the extensional world, again, is kind of is self-contained and it has an intrinsic quality about it. And the whole point is to match up our thoughts and our language to correspond. That word correspond again, and that word correspond is in here, right? And so that's the kind of the dominant modern tradition of philosophy that wants to think about objective reality as knowable language as being able to mediate that objective reality neutrally and accurately. And then, of course, our knowledge and our thoughts and our ability to discern and understand and respond to those objective neutral phenomena, right? And if we line everything up and if everything's corresponding, reality, language, thought, expression, your thought, reality, behavior, everything should harmonize. And that's what we call order, and that's what we call progress, let's say, right? So obviously he's going to be taking issue with that. He obviously falls in the rhetoric man side of things, but he has a very particular way of coming at this, which is, uh, I think, quite useful and interesting and helpful. Um, so let's see here, page 65, crap. Uh, looks like we have two different readings. We're going to have to change the prompt. Sorry, I've been doing this for a while, and so the page numbers on the guide don't quite correspond with our reading. Um, so I guess I'll just have to shuttle back and forth here best I can. So the first point on the prompt here, two, two philosophers, two kinds of philosophers. Some have remained faithful, other philosophers realizing. Um, yeah, so this is like the bottom of the first page here, right in the middle there. These philosophers take science as the paradigmatic human activity. This is the serious man philosopher. And they insist that natural science discovers truth rather than makes it. That's a key distinction between serious and rhetoric man. Serious man discovers truth because it's out there. It's intrinsic to the reality that we exist in. And therefore, our scientific efforts can discover what is the truth. And then all we have to do is line up our language to, again, correspond to that discovered truth, right? Um, they think of politics and art as spheres in which the notion of truth is out of place, right? So if we discover, if truth is just something that we discover, not make, then art and politics are like aberrations of truth, essentially. We need to kind of watch ourselves there. Other philosophers, bottom of that first page, realizing that the world as it is described by the physical sciences teaches no moral lesson, offers no spiritual comfort, have concluded that science is no more than the handmaiden of technology. These philosophers have ranged themselves alongside the political utopian innovative artists. Whereas the first kind of philosopher contrasts hard scientific fact with subjective truth or with metaphor, the second kind sees science as one more human activity rather as the place uh, at which human beings encounter a hard non-human reality. On this view, great scientists invent descriptions of the world which are useful for purposes of predicting and controlling what happens, just as poets and political thinkers invent other descriptions for other purposes. But there is no sense in which any of these descriptions is an accurate representation of the, rep of the world in itself. This is a key moment already, right early on here. This is the top of page four. This business of the serious man believes that science discovers truth, language mediates that discovered truth. The rhetoric man believes that all we do is describe the world as best we can, and that whatever truth might exist does not exist out there. We, it's impossible to say that truth exists out there. We can't know it. We can't access it. This is actually something I think the general semanticists would, would, would agree with, which is like, we don't have ultimate, absolute, final access to nature itself or to the kind of laws and dynamics of, of existence and reality itself. 
we're always kind of part of that process getting in our own way right and so there is no kind of ultimate separation so the rhetoric position rhetoric man position is that sci even scientists even the most objective scientists are describing reality right and we can get maybe better and better descriptions. Notice that he uses the word useful here in this passage. On this view, great scientists invent descriptions of the world which are useful for purposes of predicting and controlling what happens. So engineers describe the phenomenon of a bridge and hopefully these descriptions are useful enough and such that we can create a structure that is able to be driven over. But bridges fall. They're not always perfect. There's that building on... Um, uh, a couple of buildings on the strip, I think, that they built them and then they realized that they couldn't even inhabit them because they were built wrong. So we have our descriptions and then we have our purposes and not everything lines up all the time. It's not a perfect process, which isn't to say that science is a crapshoot. It's just that there is no sense in which it can be absolutely 100% ultimately perfectly verifiably true. We are always just in the business of using language and using our means of communication to describe and try as best we can to get it right. And then we build things and we correspondingly kind of behave based on those descriptions. But it's this constant process of describing, re-describing. Things are changing, conditions are changing, and so we need to come up with new descriptions, new language, new vocabularies, and it's on this ongoing process. It's not about getting language to be more and more accurate so that it better and better reflects that objective truth out there. It's more about understanding that all we're ever doing with language is describing things in a way that suits our immediate needs right now and hopefully serves some purpose that we're trying to um, achieve, right? This is where his pragmatic orientation kind of shows itself, right? So he's interested in Rejecting the serious man approach to language, which thinks that it's this kind of neutral medium that reflects objective reality and objective truth, and it's more, again, about this kind of performance. Again, he'll talk about language games in a little bit, right? So it's, it's a process that we're constantly engaging in, in different spheres of human activity, always trying to better describe what's going on in the world using our language, using our symbol systems, using our imagery, using our norms and all the rest of it to try to align with what's going on out there, right? And so it's always this kind of, at the end he calls this a kind of passing, right? This business of passing, which is, I think of it as a groping. You're in the dark and you're trying to find your way, right? Um, we're always kind of trying to do this. We're always trying to keep up with ev events and circumstances as they're changing and evolving. And so our language changes and evolves to try to keep up with what's going on out there, right? Like tools, right? So we have new, better tools that better fit with these problems or these circumstances. Those old tools, they kind of work, but they're not quite as good. Um, so, you know, like I, I used to play a lot of golf. When I first started playing golf, metal woods were all the rage. Ooh, we just come out of the actual wood woods, wood drivers, right? The things you hit off the tee-off box. This is back in the, like, 90s, metal woods. Ooh, right? Everyone's so excited. They go so far. Now you don't really find those anywhere. You find new materials, different materials. You find courses getting longer. The holes are getting longer to accommodate these new clubs that can hit the ball really far. The ball itself is getting sort of able to be hit further and so everything's kind of changing in relation to everything else right and same with language we're just kind of like updating our terminology to core better i don't want to say correspond to better <laughs> match up with the circumstances as we find them <clears throat> number three here it says on the prompt the world is out there but descriptions of the world are not only descriptions of the world can be true or, or false that's key right so whatever we consider to be true is a function of language and not a function of the reality itself which again is sort of inaccessible in an ultimate sense even with all of our fancy instruments we can never get it all right um so we describe and describe and describe and hopefully those descriptions yield outcomes that are favorable for our usages um the world does not speak only we do number five right so reality is kind of silent inert indifferent to us it just is right reminds me of kenneth burke's line there's no negatives in nature negatives are something that are a property of language this idea of no or thou shalt not or any idea of negative right that's just that doesn't exist out there that's that's our creation so um to what extent we might be able to talk about truth is attached to our language games so we'll get to that um 
let's see here. This is bottom of page four, top of page five. There's lots of key stuff. Bottom of page four, what was needed and what were the idealists were unable to envisage was a rep repudiation of the very idea of anything, mind or matter, self or world, having an intrinsic nature to be expressed or represented. So this business of intrinsic nature or essence is pretty important to the serious man, right? For the serious man, the self has an intrinsic nature, stable, permanent. Language has an intrinsic nature. It has a kind of design purpose, right? Reality itself has an intrinsic nature, or an essence is another way of talking about this thing. The idea of an essence is like a quality that inheres to the thing, that is always timelessly there and sort of makes it what it is, right? It's sort of uh, core properties or attributes of a thing. Um, I was just somehow watching a video about this on YouTube this morning, and the, the example was a knife. Right? It's like you can change the, the, the handle of a knife from metal to wood. You can wrap things around it. But the essence of a knife is sharpness. The example in the video was the blade is the essence. But I don't think the blade is the essence. I think sharpness is the essence, right? Because a blade can get dull. You need to sharpen it. So the whole point of a knife is sharpness. This person was saying that's its essence. The rhetoric man wants to reject the idea of essences or intrinsic nature completely. Everything just is what it is, right? And so language comes along as this kind of pragmatic, instrumental, invisible thing that helps us do things in the world, right? And so that's about it. And so it's a matter of kind of aligning our um, descriptions of what's going on out there with our performances and our kind of games, right? Very bottom of four, we need to make a distinction between the claim that the world is out there and the claim that the truth is out there. To say that the world is out there, that it is not our creation, is to say with common sense that most things in space and time are the effects of causes which do not include human mental states. Things are going on out there that have nothing to do with us. Most of it, in fact. To say that the truth is not out there is simply to say that when there are no sentences, there is no truth, that sentences are elements in human languages, and that human languages are human creations. That's the rhetoric man position. Hopefully that's crystal clear at this point. Um, he uses the word corresponding on this page in that last big paragraph on five right in the middle. Um, and he mentions language games as well. He says, when we consider examples of alternative language games, the vocabulary of ancient Athenian politics versus Jefferson's, the moral vocabulary, the jargon of Newton versus that of Aristotle. So this idea of language games, which he fleshes out more detail as we go, um, is a way to describe a kind of a domain of like human social activity or just human activity. You can talk about religion as a language game. You can talk about what's going on in a, a, a biology lab as its own kind of language game. I'm an academic. I publish research. Whenever I do that, I have to go through this language game of like, you guys are familiar with it, the whole formatting and like MLA and Chicago and APA. That's its own kind of language game. The whole process of peer review, a blind peer review. Again, another kind of language game. When we say game, we don't mean silly, trivial, meaningless, not at all. What we mean is something that we engage in that doesn't have rules that come from some godlike authority, but the rules essentially come from the enterprise itself, right? Love hanging out with kids because they always want to invent new games and they come up with all these wacky rules to like make the game more fun or more this or less that. Um, it's essentially the same when you think about society is that we come up with these enterprises and then we come up with language that's sort of appropriate to those enterprises, the legal language, the athletic sports language, the fashion business language. These are all different kinds of games with their own senses of purpose and their own descriptions of the real phenomenon that they're engaging with, right? That's sort of kind of the core idea in a nutshell, um, already at 20 minutes. So let's see, on page six, the first big paragraph, the world does not speak, only we do. Pretty important paragraph. The realization that the world does not tell us what language games to play should not, however, lead us to say that a decision about which to play is arbitrary. This is important. Do I have it on here? Um, I'll have to revisit these prompts to update them for you. Uh, but page six here is, is super important. The point is, is like if we're talking about language games as opposed to the serious man idea that language mediates a hard essential reality and all we have to do is get better and better at being more accurate and clear. If we accept this language game idea, 
we need to be careful not to go fully in the direction of like nothing means anything it's all just this kind of arbitrary crapshoot so he's saying it's not that okay he says it should not however lead us to say that a decision about which to play is arbitrary in the sense of like doesn't matter nor to say that it is the expression of something deep within us. The moral is not that objective criteria for choice of vocabulary are to be replaced with subjective criteria, reason with will or feeling. It is rather that the notions of criteria and choice are no longer in point when it comes to changes from one language game to another. So right now there's a whole new kind of vocabulary that's emerged around gender and sexuality, right? And I think it's doing exactly what, what Rory is talking about, is an attempt to re-describe kind of what we might call naturally occurring phenomenon, right? People don't feel themselves as this one kind of gender or that kind of gender, and it doesn't make a ton of sense anymore, apparently, to, to refer to ourselves in this way, right? Because I think, you know, historically, traditionally, gender roles were attached to kind of social roles, um, and there's a lot of kind of labor stuff layered in there. All of that stuff's changing, right? Now, we don't live in a kind of factory economy or an industrial economy or a material economy so much anymore. And so it doesn't make so much sense to kind of divide, you know, roles and labor along those old traditional lines. And so it makes good sense that we fe find ourselves in a moment of um, broadening in terms of who can do what and what it means to be this or that. And so there's this whole new vocabulary that's, that's emerging, right? And there's a lot of debate about these words or those words or these the right words the wrong words and he, it's doing exactly what he's talking about here where one vocabulary to talk about gender and sexuality is kind of receding and another one is, is coming into play and there is lots of kind of disagreement and contestation but this is essentially what's always happening with language it just seems to be more acute in the case of, of gender and sexuality right so the question is is like does the new vocabulary match up well with the new kind of ways that we're living, right? Think about it. We live in a kind of an, an immaterial economy where most jobs, at least the ones that we're familiar with in the cities, the jobs that are associated with um, university degrees and whatever, mostly have to do with computers and services and imagery and narratives and story. And it's very different than, you know, when my folks were coming of age, it was like, there's very limited opportunities. You know, my mom went into an office. My dad went into a factory. So circumstances change. Conditions change. And then language also changes, right, to try to kind of align better with the, the practices that are changing. Um, and it's all, again, about the descriptions. And what he's saying is, is that there's not criteria for, like, which one's better because the criteria emerge from that or organic sense of need and utility, essentially, right? Um, so it all just kind of happens more or less naturally and organically and always has, right? We can think about other vocabularies that have come and go. Um, certain scientific vocabularies, certain religious vocabularies, certain technological vocabularies. My goodness, even in my own life, I, there, I get such a kick out of these videos that show uh, like Gen Z, like young, young folks of, of our moment right now, you, you see these older, you know, baby boomer Gen X types like handing them an old rotary phone. I saw this one video of these two young guys being handed a rotary phone, which is what we used to use before cells and the internet and all that. It's like the big phones that were attached to the wall with the long cords, you know, and they ring and you'd have to like dial them this way. And these two young dudes were like, it's like something dropped out of the, the sky and they just had no idea how to use it. They're trying to figure it out, right? So we adapt our language, our tools to meet circumstances. Circumstances change and we're constantly readapting and, and so on. Um, yeah, so on page nine, that second paragraph, he says, the, the, the method of philosophy is the same as the method of utopian politics. The method is to redescribe lots and lots of things in new ways until you have created a pattern of linguistic behavior which will tempt the rising generation to adopt it, thereby causing them to look for appropriate new forms of linguistic behavior, right? And I wrote in the column here, groping. We're always kind of groping for new language. Now, maybe the new vocabulary of gender and sex won't hold. Maybe not all of it will. Maybe only some of it will, right? There's a lot of pronoun sort of changes that are up in the air. Who knows how much of that will actually carry forward moving forward. Moving, uh, moving into the next generation. 
But that's the kind of moment we're in. Is like, let's re-describe stuff. Let's come up with new terms because the practices and the realities and the conditions and the circumstances are themselves changing. And we need to always be reorienting ourselves, right? And all right, so he then moves into this kind of lengthy examination of language, drawing on a linguist, David uh, D Donald Davidson, who he admires. And he goes through and he talks about Davidson and how Davidson sort of positions himself against the kind of more serious man philosophers of language. Um, but we don't get a ton more, frankly, beyond what we've already established. And so you can kind of get a little bit lighter here um, because he, he just does a kind of a deep dive into the, the particulars of this, this view. Um, I like, though, what he says in the bottom of 11, that last paragraph. In avoiding both reductionism and expansionism, David resembles Wittgen Wittgenstein is the one who first came up with the idea of language games. Both are philosophers. Both philosophers treat alternative vocabularies as more like alternative tools than like bits of a jigsaw puzzle. Right? So again, that pragmatic notion of philosophy here kicks in, that thinking about language as a tool is something that's useful, right? That we, we re-describe things because... Practices are changing because circumstances are changing because those old terms are kind of rusty and worn out, right? And they're dull. The blade is dull. So we need better equipment. Thinking back to Burke. Equipment for living. Language is very much about this enterprise of like doing things, accomplishing things, cooperating, right? Like aligning our interests and so on. Um, so that tool business is good. So let's see, bottom of 12, next page, 26. I got to wrap her up here. Um, we got most of the key stuff. Let's see, bottom of 12. Let's see, the proper analogy is with the invention of new tools to take the place of old tools. To come up with such a vocabulary is more like discarding the lever and the chalk because one has envisaged the pulley, or like discarding the gesso and tempura because one has now figured out how to seize, size canvas properly. Not exactly sure what those things are, but that kind of proves the point, right? Some things just kind of get like left aside. Old tools, old words, old ways of saying things, old expressions. They just kind of lost their, their, uh, their relevance. And so it's perfectly fine. It's not like we're losing truth. We're just developing new, more appropriate and relevant ways of describing how we are living now in relation to that external world that we can't finally know, right? Um, more rhetoric man, serious man. So the passing theory stuff kicks in on 14 there. In a recent paper, nicely titled A New Nice Derangement and Epitaphs, Davidson tries to undermine the notion of languages as entities by developing the notion of what he calls a passing theory. A set of guesses, a few more lines down, a set of guesses about what she will do under what conditions. Such a theory is passing because it must constantly be corrected to allow for mumbles, stumbles, malapropism, metaphors, ticks. Imagine a situation where, you know, you are placed into a room with someone who speaks a language that you've never heard before and you must accomplish some goal together right so for the first however long all you're going to be doing is trying to come up with any kind of sign system that helps you get anything done right and maybe you're trying to learn their language maybe they're trying to learn yours maybe you come up with your own language together this groping business of like grunting but trust me i've been to china not speaking a lick of the language and you find ways of sort of desperately getting through it's a lot of pointing and a lot of like learning certain basic basic things it's images it's drawing it's a calculator with numbers that's passing that's this business of passing theory and it's a good way to think about our language games in general which we're constantly groping for new descriptions new terminology that fit that that are useful that help us get done what we need to get done in this domain or in that domain right so the people who are always saying, you know, that's not the right way to say this, or that's not the right word, or that's not the right word, or that's the wrong word, or whatever, are kind of locked into that serious man idea of essences and intrinsic meanings, right? That this word intrinsically means that thing. It's like, no, words are just sort of markers and grunts that we use to stand for things that can no, that at, over time can, can no longer stand for things, right? So there's always a kind of slippage. All right. Um... And then, frankly, that's about it. Uh, he starts to go in a different direction toward the end of the chapter. Let me just look at this prompt here, make sure I got everything. Um, as history moves, number nine, it's a contest between an entrenched vocabulary which has become a nuisance and a half-formed new vocabulary which vaguely promises great things. That's good. Right, so the new vocabulary kind of comes into existence and it's promising better accuracy. It's promising more, in, in the case of today, more inclusion, more better representation, let's say, a better um, 
I'm trying to avoid correspondence, but a better kind of matching up with how things are actually playing out in the world that we live in. And I think part of the, the big debate over the language of gender right now is that we have essentially kind of two worlds. We have an urban cosmopolitan world that's highly rooted in an immaterial economy where we're totally divorced and detached from those older ways of, of making a living, right? Going into mines and factories and fields, right? And then we have another America where that still is the reality, where there's farms and there's cowboys and there's factories and there's trucks and there's like real material things that still kind of relies on that distinction between male and female because of the kind of labor, right? And so this is at least how I'm thinking about this sort of moment we're in and thinking about it in relation to Davidson and Rorty and this idea of language games and redescribing and utility, right? That makes good sense that... Social reality is changing. Social circumstances are changing, and therefore language chains sort of along with it, right? And but it's not the same everywhere, and so that's why you, I think, we have a lot of these like clashes, is because it's not so different still in parts of our country, whereas it's very different in other parts, right? Um, passing theory, the number fourteen is interesting to think about history of language and culture not as an arrow of progress but as a coral reef as something that's always kind of taking shape in these adding new domains and evolving sort of like this instead of just like advancement advancement getting better getting more accurate it's just not tenable right um so let's drop the idea of language as a representation let's drop the idea of language as a medium that reflects and represents an objective reality. It just does not. So that's a repudiation and a rejection of the serious man tradition, right? So Rorty is obviously a rhetoric man and is making a, a pretty bold and impassioned argument for just how it is that that rhetoric man position works with language, right? So again, language is not, 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 just a medium that represents and reflects objective reality. It doesn't do that. It does not give us truth. What it does give us is action. What it does give us is the ability to get things done in this domain, in this domain, in this domain. I mean, just think about regional accents. Excuse me. Anywhere you go in this world, you're going to find an accent. Why? We say the same words, but we say them differently. I lived in China for a while, and I actually got to the point of being able to sort of discern the distinctions between a Beijing accent and a Shanghai accent. Even, you know, it doesn't matter where you go, there's always these variations. Why is that? Because the way that we're living here is not exact same as the way that we're living there. Alabama is not the same as Ohio, which is not the same as Florida, which is not the same as New York, which is not the same as California, Northern California, not the same as Southern California. So it's very much about how we live, where we live, the specific kind of material conditions that we're engaging in. And the language is always kind of filling up the gaps to give us what we are trying to accomplish, right? So let's think about language more as a kind of pragmatic thing that also shapes our reality instead of just reflecting it. So that's another challenge for the general semanticist is this notion that language doesn't just mediate in a neutral way, it shapes, it influences. That was the theme with McLuhan, that's the theme with Burke, and now that's the theme with Rorty. So this is how we're challenging the general semantics kind of basic assumption, that serious man idea. So we'll see a little bit more of this with Burke with occupational psychosis and trained incapacity. I need to shut her down. 30 minutes is about as long as I ever want to go with these videos. So that's a quick tour through Rorty. Um, like I said, I'll update these um, uh, the, the prompt notes and hopefully that's good. Enjoy.